Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and start, and uh, and that way uh, we've still got some stragglers coming along, but they they'll hear the noise, and they can be they can be moving this way. This the first part here is is uh, uh, David R. Thomas was not one of the miners who died in the favorable explosion, but he is a key character in the story. <clears throat> And I thought it would be worthwhile to start at his headstone because he provided so much information uh, about the miners at that, at that period of time. My name is Barry Thacker and uh, Carol Moore, I call it the, I, I call it, the uh, it, it uses the poor old dumb coal miner stereotype. You know, that these miners were abused, uh, that they were forced to work in the mines, but nothing could be farther from the truth. This was an opportunity for them to, uh, for a new way of life. Uh, they chose this way of life uh, out, of, out of their own initiative. And I think the best example of that is when their jobs were threatened by the convict lease system, uh, they literally went to war with the state of Tennessee to protect their jobs. So again, nobody was forcing them to do this. And I'm starting here at David R. Thomas's headstone because he was one of the Welsh who came to this area after the Civil War. Got to remember, Knoxville and the surrounding area was pretty well destroyed. Uh, and the, the community leaders at that time wanted to rebuild. And they, they, uh, they looked around and said, well, what do we have to offer to bring capital to this area? And what, what the area had was natural resources. Uh, the coal for all of the industrial development came from here in Coal Creek, so it fits very, Im uh, it's an important part of the story about the redevelopment of the area after the Civil War. But the community leaders of that day had a problem, uh, and that was they didn't know who was going to do the coal, they didn't know who was going to do the actual mining, so what they did was they recruited experienced Welsh miners to come to this area. David R. Thomas was one of them. And why did the Welsh come here? Why would they, did they look for this as an opportunity? Well, because for whatever reason, the English just did not like the Welsh. You've heard of New South Wales, the British penal colony. If the English had their way, they would have arrested all the Welsh and shipped them off to, uh, to Australia. Uh, and so because the, is it too loud? Okay, because, the, uh, because of the way they were treated there, uh, in 1847, British Parliament even went so far as to ban use of the Welsh language in Great Britain. And when it became a crime to practice in their native tongue, the Welsh said, we're out of here, and they came to America. And they saw this area of Tennessee as an, as an area to, uh, to develop because, the, because of the need for experienced miners, this is where they came. They started working in 1876 in, the, uh, in a little mine uh, of the Knoxville Iron Company, and at that point there were between 100 and 150 Welsh miners. In, 18, in fact, it was such a, a lucrative area uh, that the state of Tennessee decided to get into the act and started leasing convicts to work in the mines because of the money that, that could be made. And the Welsh, uh, many of them left the area after that. Some of them stayed and went to work in some of the other mines. David R. Thomas was an individual who uh, first started working in the Knoxville Iron Company mine and then went to work in the Freighterville mine. And one thing that, that made him unique was his love for reading. And what he would collect, in fact, he got, the, he got it from his father. His father started collecting Welsh books. That was, it was published in the Welsh language. Uh, but they were published in America. And uh, the Welsh looked at, at their, their life in America as an obligation to preserve their native, native language and their native culture. Because remember, it was illegal to use uh, their native language in Great Britain, but here they had the freedom to do that. So they wrote books in the Welsh language and published them. And David's father, Rhys R. Thomas, collected those books and then his father passed those on to David, and then David eventually donated them to Harvard University. And I'm going to read the start of this book here. It's called The Welsh of Tennessee. 
It says over 300 Welsh language books and pamphlets were published in the United States during the 19th century, and close to half of those are included in the Celtic book collection at Harvard's Widener University. It says, as prominent as many such previous owners were, hardly anything is known of the individual whose name appears most frequently. And it goes on to talk about Rhys R. Thomas and David R. Thomas, and why they are important, again, is because they donated these, these books to Harvard, and Dr. Davies has translated those books into English, and it's the story of the, uh, of the miners of this area uh, between the end of the Civil War and really up until the Cross Mountain disaster, for, so from 1867 to 1911, and it's told in the words of the coal miners. So it really is a fresh, contemporary account of the times from, from, from the men who live there. One other, one other thing while we're here, we had a field trip yesterday with the students at Bryceville Elementary School and, and I, was tell, I was telling them about, uh, about an individual who was a school teacher back in 1894. And again, when you, when you, when you research history, I would rather read what the individuals wrote at the time rather than reading 100 years later what some, somebody's interpretation of what conditions were. So that's why the Welsh of Tennessee is such a valuable reference. Even if your family wasn't Welsh, it was written by Welsh miners and those were the ones who trained the, freighterville, the native freighterville miners the art of coal mining. So therefore, it's a, again, it's a contemporary look at, of the times. Here's another one. This is a story by, uh, by B. Rule Stout. Uh, he started out as a school teacher in Anderson County in the 1890s, and he later studied civil engineering and became general manager and director of Coal Creek Mining, became director of Coal Creek Mining and Manufacturing Company. He retired from the company at the age of 88 and became its consulting engineer for life. He also wrote a book called Visions of Verse, and here's his story about being a school teacher in 1894. So for many of the Freighterville miners, some of them, they were students in 1894. Many of the other ones had children who were students in 1894. But here's a story that this individual wrote about being a teacher back at that time. And he said, when I was 17 years old, I started teaching school back in the Cumberland Mountains to find that the students, five of them grown and older than me, had whipped and run off four previous teachers. I knew there would be a showdown, so I made me a pointer that was as strong and heavy as a billiard cue in case I needed it. But I decided, if possible, on a wrestling trick at which I was very good, diving between one's legs and throwing him over my head. One day, Miller Duncan said, I guess this is about the time to find out who is boss around here and made a lunge at me. And in three seconds, he had gone over my head straight for a sharp edge post, that post splitting his head. After he had received a dash of water from the school drinking gourd, he and everyone in school knew who was boss. I had no further trouble. So again, I love those kinds of stories because you're not reading uh, what somebody thought about it 100 years later. You're reading what life was like at that period of time. So with this, what we're going to do is we're going to walk over to the um, to the circle here, uh, and 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 have the uh, an additional part of the story. But one other thing about David R. Thomas, he retired from the Freighterville mine three months before it exploded. He was one of the individuals who provided testimony at the inquest, and he began his testimony by saying. I started working in the mines when my daddy carried me on his back. So with that, let's walk over to the, uh, the large monument there at Miner Circle and we'll continue the story. Uh, as I said, the, uh, when we started the story over there, the, the well started out in 1867. 1877, state of Tennessee decided that they wanted to get in on the action and make money and lease convicts to work in the mines. For many years, um, a large percent of the state revenue in the state of Tennessee came from leasing convicts 
to work in coal mines. So you can see that the, um, the state had the incentive to keep that program going. Uh, but in 1891, additional convicts were brought to a mine in Bryceville, and the miner said, that's enough. We're not going to put up with this anymore. So they, um, they uh, met in a field. In fact, this book I was telling you about, The Welsh of Tennessee, shows the meeting that they had at Thistle Switch, and David R. Thomas is the gentleman standing up against the tree with a derby hat. But the miners got together, they came up with a plan as to how they were going to address the convict lease system. They uh, uh, surrounded the stockades, they uh, captured the miners and the, uh, the, the, excuse me, the convicts and the guards. They marched them to the train depot in the town of Coal Creek, put them on a train to Knoxville, and then sent a telegram to the governor saying, you're not going to work convicts in Coal Creek anymore. Well, the governor couldn't put up with that, so he sent the military, the Tennessee National Guard. Two weeks later, the, uh, the miners again surrounded the convict stockades. This time, they captured the convicts, the guards, and the soldiers that had been sent, marched them to the train depot in the town of Coal Creek, put them on a train to Knoxville, and then sent another telegram to the governor saying, uh, you're not going to work convicts in Coal Creek anymore. So that was the start of the Cold Creek War. So that's what I said. Uh, nobody held guns to these miners' head, forcing them to work in the mine. To the contrary, they literally went to war to protect their jobs in, in the coal mines. Well, the miners lost the final battle of the Cold Creek War, but they won the war when the, um, when the state of Tennessee, when the legislature decided to end convict leasing. You know, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't that the um, that the state thought that uh, there was a problem with the convict lease system, uh, and and uh, whereas the miners did not only did it did it did it cost them their jobs, but the convicts weren't coal miners. They didn't know what they were doing, and as a result of them, many many of the convicts died in mining accidents. But what the state did was they agreed to end the convict lease system, system because they found a better way to make money. The state bought land uh, in Morgan County at, the Brushy, at Brushy Mountain and built Brushy Mountain Prison and Coal Mine. And for the next 40 years, the state of Tennessee was in the coal mining business using convicts as a source of labor. So it remained one of the main sources of, of revenue in the state of Tennessee until the late 19, 1930s. But after the Cold Creek War, life was good in, in the area. Uh, new miners came in. Uh, they, they even built an opera house in Bryceville. Built new schools, churches, roads. But then on May 19, 1902, 110 years ago today, the mines grew still when the Freyerville mine exploded, uh, killing over 216 men and boys. Now, that's what the newspaper said, that it was 216. But there's only 184 names on the monument there. And later on today, we will be visiting the Freighterville Itinerant Miner Cemetery, and I'll tell you the story about the other 32 that died but are not listed on the monument here. So, uh, uh, here at, at the Miner Circle, the, the, uh, originally, the plan was to bury all of the miners here, but there was a, uh, there was a problem during the, during the interment. Uh, there was a disagreement, and, and uh, finally several families decided to bury their kinfolk uh, in other cemeteries. One of, the, one of the stories was that there were 11 African-American miners <coughs> buried here because uh, not only did the Welsh teach native Tennesseans new mining skills, they, thought, they taught African Americans new mining skills. Uh, in fact, the Welsh developed a particularly close relationship with the Welsh. They even practiced uh, their religion together in, some of the same, in, in the same church at one point in time. So, and that's why eight of the African American miners from Freyerville are buried in Welsh Cemetery uh, in, in, the y, in the Y community. But anyway, 89 miners are buried in concentric circles. 
I, what I would like for you to do is, uh, in a minute, I want to hear from some of the descendants of the miners buried here. We have the Desern brothers over here. Five Desern brothers died in the in the explosion. Uh, Bannister Val and his three sons died in the explosion in this cemetery. I believe there were seven or eight Wallaces. Uh, they were cousins, brothers and cousins in the Wallace family that died. Several Webbs uh, who died in the explosion. But at this point, I'd like I said, I'd like for some of the descendants of miners who are buried here in Leach Cemetery, I want to invite you to come forward and tell us a little bit about your family. Uh, and again, you, you might think, well, I don't know anything. Well, you might be surprised at, at what you know. Uh, when, when we had the 100th anniversary for, for uh, the Cross Mountain Mine disaster, we had, uh, we had an individual like that who didn't think that she knew much about her family. But, but what she did was, she said that when her family left this area, her mother gave her a, made a charm bracelet with a piece of coal on it. And that uh, she's, you know, passed, she, she's had that for her entire life, and she's going to pass that down to her daughter. And her mother told her that you come from a coal mining family, and we don't want you ever to lose your heritage. Uh, so, again, if you know stories like that, we would love to hear them. So anybody like to come up here and talk? Where's Louise? I'm sure Louise would like to talk to us. Come on up here, Louise. <coughs> now let's see, Louise. I think Louise is uh, 47 years old, and and um, come on back here. I really am not prepared. Um, to talk, but I would like to say that if it hadn't been for Barry and Carol, uh, I knew nothing about my heritage other than at 12 years of age, my mother was orphaned and uh, she was sent to Illinois to live with an aunt and she never wanted to talk about her father because as Barry said uh, back then, uh, minors were considered poor, ignorant people and that was the way that she was told and that we thought for years but we never were ashamed we were proud that we had a grandfather who had had a good job uh, during all those years but um, she never talked much about her family until I became about um, I guess I was about nine or ten years old and we came back here and uh, we came up to this monument and we'd walk up there and we'd hold my sister and I'd hold our hands over the names and but that's all it meant it was the it, that was all my mother would be very sad she would not talk on the way away from here we never talked so for years uh, I really never knew a thing about my grandfather but now that they have started uh, giving us information it's um, been wonderful to know about a family that you didn't have in such a wonderful family and I am so proud to be a granddaughter uh, in the discern family because uh, I have found now that I do have a family and that my children and my great-grandchildren which I have six of uh, all know now and I, I thank you Fred and I thank you for um, giving me this opportunity in my family, a family that we're proud of. We've always been proud, but not to the extent that we are now because my grandmother with five caskets in her house at one time, she was a very strong woman. And that makes me feel like I'm gonna be strong just like her too. Anybody else have a, have a minor buried here that would like to uh, share something with us? Well, if not, what I would like for you to do is I would like for the families, uh, the descendants... They said it was coming from him. And he said the rats had left the day before, left the mines, and they should have known, you know, not to go in, but they went in anyhow. And um, they brought them down to Lake City at the knitting mill and laid them out until they could get coffins from, uh, they got, I were around that they had to go and get coffins because they didn't have enough in Lake City to, or Cold Creek to bury them. 
and uh, that's about all I know about that I can come right up and say. Go Terry. <laughs>